You're listening to Love and Light with Dr. Lisa, Everyday Living in Peace. Day-to-day living can be difficult in our world today, and most people don't know how to live a peaceful, joy-filled existence. The key to this is simple, love. Join me, Dr. Lisa Collins, for the next hour as I unpack and identify the need for a peaceful, love-filled existence by engaging the challenging and hard topics of life. On this show, you will lean into the healing practices that enlarge your spiritual reality through the act of love. This kind of love begins with yourself and your neighbor and transcends age, race, sex, generation, class, and sexual identity. The world changes when we root ourselves in love. Love and Light with Dr. Lisa starts now. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Lisa, and you're listening to Love and Light, Living Every Day in Peace on Transformation Talk Radio. Stay with us for the next hour and let us help you experience how to bring more love into your everyday life. We're here each second and fourth Wednesday from 1 p.m. Pacific Time, 12 Mountain, and 4 Eastern. And we will have tools for living every day in peace. Have you ever been to the backcountry of Alaska? Me either until July of this year, 2022. I participated in Project Rome with Chad Brown's Love, Love is King. This leadership program, believe it or not, expands the experiences of leaders of color to support and advocate for nature, conservancy, and experience the outdoors. Was it amazing? (laughs) Yes, and more, absolutely. So welcome to the Alaska Wildlife Refuge and the experience of the big sky, breathtaking nature, and environmental justice on Love and Light with Dr. Lisa. Project Rome, Love is King Project Rome, is an experience, a rapid ongoing advanced mission to provide opportunity for Black, Indigenous, people of color, leaders to step into the realm of public land and freshwater conservancy and disrupt the historical systems that allowed BIPOC voices not to be heard and not to be invited into spaces where decisions were made about land and wildlife and Indigenous conversations. That's directly from their website. Now, I got an opportunity to go. Well, how did that happen? Literally, someone asked me, do you want to fish on the river? And that's enough. And I said, yes, immediately. What does it take to be in the backcountry? Well, I got to tell you, I'm not a camper. I've never been in the backcountry. I've camped a few times. You count them on my hand. And... um. I heard about the freedom of being out in nature and thought, I think I, I, my soul said yes before any part of my mind or body thought about being in the back country in Alaska. And I applied. I, first, I came home and asked, do you, do you think this is a good idea? And I got tons of support from all my support community. And I said, yes, I was accepted. And then I prepared to go to the back country. Wow. Uh, It's hard to explain what it was actually like to be um, a lay person and then be hiking on the tundra in the back country. But I got to tell you, if I could do it, anybody can do it. It was an amazing experience, absolutely amazing. And what I took away are some things that we're going to talk about in the podcast today. First of all, I did not um, realize that there was a piece of land in Alaska that um, is up, up for discussion and the government's talking about drilling on that piece of land. That land is called 1002. They have a number for it. And the Alaska Wildlife Refuge is a whole large piece of Alaska that's protected. It's on the eastern side. And on the other side of Alaska is um, right between where I was is the um, Arctic 
the gates of the Arctic. These are lands that less than 1% of people even go to or even walk on. So this little piece of land, this 1002, is people want to drill on it. They want to start, and it is the last piece of indigenous land that has not been taken in colonialism. So that's the context of um, why I was there and what I learned. That's a context of this piece of land. And right now people are discussing, uh, it's called the Willow Project. People are making decisions about this little piece of land. Well, what difference does that make? When I got there, one of the first places that we that we went to was we got all our gear, uh, lots of gear. So your gear includes your food, your tent, your pad, your clothes, um, your jet boil for warming your food. Um, got all our gear together and we took a bush plane. We took a bush plane to um, to the village where the kitchen tribe lives and it's it's um Gitchin is describes many tribes in Alaska and Canada but this particular um particular village we took a bush plane to and we were permitted to be in the village in the village we couldn't go anywhere unless we were escorted so it was very much a privilege to be there. And there I heard elders talk about their experience um, and their experience with the current climate change. And one of the elders said, this is ground zero for climate change. And I experienced that firsthand. I was in the village for a couple of days. There was electricity, we had shelter, there was not running water. The water we use was the water, water from the river. And, um, and I was able to hear from the second chief, Leonard. Um, I was able to hear from an elder, Charlie, and I was able to hear from another, another couple of elders, which on upcoming shows, um, I will be sharing their voices and hear, and you will hear from them firsthand. And, what I'm talking about today is the actual experience of going there and what that was like. And I feel like we have the experience that we're, you know, I'm just going to say that I'm very privileged. I live in, I live in a, a, a place where I, I, I have very little need or want it may even wants. And I, I went to a place where um, the decision about drilling and climate change is affecting the lives of people right now, right today. And so um, it was, it was eye opening. It was very eye opening to see those, the oil drilling. It was eye opening to see the pipeline, the actual pipeline. Uh, it was eye opening to hear the, the struggle of the indigenous uh, people who live there, who shepherd the caribou tribe, the porcupine caribou, over 200,000 caribou. And in this um, wonderful connection of life and community, the caribou take care of the people and the people take care of the caribou. And with the thought of that drilling and the change of the land, like Chief Leonard said, um, it's affecting the caribou, therefore affecting the people. And I don't know about you, but I don't have, I don't have anything that's affecting me in, in that way where someone else is making, it. we all have that, but it's to the extreme. Someone's making a decision and it's affecting your livelihood, like literally whether or not the tribe continues or doesn't continue. So Project Rome, uh, Love is King, gave me the opportunity to be able to first travel 
because they took me there to Alaska. We flew into Fairbanks to be able to go to the Arctic Village where I was able to engage and listen to the stories of the indigenous people who lived there and then allowed me to leave from there and then drive up the Dalton Highway and hike on the tundra and be in um, the land which not very many people have set their foot on and be able to see what it's like there and to be able to experience the climate change that is actually occurring. I experienced it. It was 24 hour daylight and I experienced snow and sleet and rain in and uh, the time that I was there. So you are listening to Love and Light with me, Dr. Lisa, and I'm discussing environmental justice and the fantastic opportunity to travel to Alaska with Love is King, who provides leadership for people like me to be able to come back and do what I'm doing right now, being able to advocate for nature conservancy. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. to the outdoors I think really took off when I had small children I wanted them to experience fishing I wanted them to experience the outdoors the forest the rainforest I wanted them to experience all of those things and I wanted them to see things that I didn't see when I was younger but I always had a yearning like my soul calling to be out in nature and to experience nature and so that connection for me, I think started at my grandfather's farm, but continued on as I um, got older and sought out places where I could connect with nature. Oregon rivers are important to me. So much has happened in our world. We need more healing, and healing comes from nature. Healing comes from taking care of ourselves and taking care of our souls. And as the water runs in, it heals and it soothes and all that is seems to come together. Water is a necessity of life. It is around us and it is vital to be near it and around it. I am grateful for the River Democracy Act to protect Oregon rivers for my children and the generations to come. Water is a necessity to life and being near it, in it and around it provides comfort and peace. We're back on Love and Light, Living Every Day in Peace. Environmental justice is what we're talking about. And the opportunity to travel to Alaska with Love is King. I learned so many things uh, being in the back country, being able to communicate and listen to the stories of the indigenous tribe, the caribou people who are there, um, and also being able to travel in the mindset. So, um, if you're thinking like, there's no way, like I'm not going to a back country. The first thing you may think about is bears, grizzlies. I thought about all those things too. But one thing about Chad Brown, and I'm going to mention him, um, the CEO as Love is King is that Chad's story is one of, um, Chad is a vet. Um, he came back from the war. He experienced post-traumatic stress syndrome and it was the other veterans that took him out to nature where he began his healing process and Chad's work he works with um, students um, uh, it's called Soul River look it up I'll make sure that all the resources are on the website to bring uh, high school students to nature 
and to pair them with a vet, a veteran, and to that partnership, that community, and to be out in nature. So his story is he is constantly an advocate for nature and an advocate for nature for all people. And I didn't grow up backpacking like I did this summer. No way. But the opportunity was amazing. And I'll talk a little bit about the actual, you know, preparing. So one of the things was to get the proper gear. Um, I, I got that. And I felt like if I had the gear under Chad's leadership, that I could do it. I really felt like that. I prepared myself physically because walking on the tundra was, um, I don't think people really can describe what walking on the tundra is like. So the tundra is kind of like the the mossy um the mossy ground and under it is permafrost. The permafrost is the unthawing of the ground and it has to be um, two years of unthawing for it to be permafrost. So when you step your foot on the ground, it could go either down far, far um, into water or it could go just a little bit. And there's these grassy knolls called tufts and you could put your foot on that and it could be totally solid or you could put your foot on it and you could roll your ankle. So walking across there that you have those challenges of walking or hiking on it. And then the other challenge is for your feet to remain dry. And your feet need to be dry because if your feet get too much moisture, uh, you could get something called trench foot, which is the the moisture has lost your feet and it uh I heard it's not good to get. So you don't want to get that. So you need to stay dry. And then you need to for me, the strategy was I use trekking poles to how am I gonna go across here without getting wet? And believe it or not, you may maybe there's some serious backcountry people out there that are listening. Wool socks are the socks you wear. I would have never thought wool socks would be it, but cotton kills, uh, which means that you don't want cotton. And so I was successful. I was able to hike across for me like a mile and a half. Um, I was able to stay dry while I did that. And I was able to enjoy it. And it was difficult. It, it was, I want to say it's like stair steppers, but not quite because your foot could go way, way down or very lightly down. So that was part of it, getting all your gear, you put your, you know, your pack on, it's on your hips. And a lot of people say, well, I can't, I can't, I couldn't possibly. Well, you can, you can. And when you have the kind of supports I had to attend, I think if I could do it, kind of like they say on Rock the Park, you can do it. So that was part of it is getting all the gear. And then we went to the Arctic village. We spent time there. It was during caribou hunting time. So, um, we were able to try caribou. Um, it was, was really good. And the, we were able to hear about the process of that time of year, getting the caribou, um, getting food for the village. And I um, typically go to the store. I don't, I don't hunt for my food. And I, I know people in the United States that hunt for their food every year, um, hunt and then dress the animal and uh, freeze the food. Um, you know what? It just really takes you to a different place. Um, it takes you to a different place to think about all the things that we have, all the things that are at our, at our fingertips, really. And uh, this was, this was life. This was life there. Also, it was um, something to think about that Alaska had been colonized and they had uh, four different religious organizations had split up the area or the region. And so in the particular village we were in, there was some Episcopal uh, religion there and not everyone had that religion, but there was like an Episcopal church that had gone back many generations. And um, for us to, to, for, to think about here we are 
trying to find out about the indigenous experience and the colonialism that um, has its hand there that has been there for many, many generations through religion. And so um, I think four different religions, I think uh, Greek Orthodox, um, Catholic, Episcopal, and maybe Lutheran had broken up the region and superimposed their, their religion on the people who were there. So that was uh, that was interesting. Um, the climate change, the, the actual, what I saw and what I heard from the elders is that the, you know, rivers are drying up. There's uh, mudslides. The caribou um, have to travel for water. So that affects the people in the village because they, they count on the caribou. Um, and then also that the caribou has these um, these hollows in their feet where they can walk during different different seasons. And when those hollows get um, are not able to work properly, then that also affects the migration of the herd, as well as um, what one thing they said is the caribou is not, they're not having as much fat on them as they, they typically do. And what does all this have to do with, with, uh, with oil? Well, the expansion of the oil drilling affects, and it affects nature and it affects the, the water. It affects everything. And here I am in, in my house with, with my car, not even realizing that that Alaska pipeline is huge it is it is an eyesore <laughs> i've heard about it all my life but when i saw it it just broke my heart it literally broke my heart to see all of this beautiful nature like nature 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 beautiful nature and then to see this huge pipeline i mean just it's huge it's go on my instagram and you'll see a picture of me by this ginormous ginormous um pipeline and i'm smiling in the picture because i had made it on the tundra but when i saw that pipeline it, it broke my heart and i think that if more people um were visiting were hiking were out in the back country to see what i've seen you too would come back and be advocating for nature conservancy. You two would be coming back and saying, what can I do? And one of the things that um, I did when I got back was I was able to um, do a little something for, for actually the state I live in, Oregon, for Oregon Rivers. And we'll be able to listen to and play, play, that, um, play that promo about protecting Oregon Rivers. Part, I'm forever changed because I am going to advocate for for nature. I'm going to advocate for um, our environment, for for us being better at um, taking care of where where we are, taking care of things for the future, for my children and for children to come. So it's um, I'm forever changed in that way. Being um, the travel. So after going to uh, to the Arctic Village, being in the Arctic Circle, passing the Yukon River, we took the Dalton Highway, which is one of the most dangerous highways. Um, it goes all the way up to the Arctic Ocean. And it's not paved. It's not a highway like you would think. Um, they call it a highway, but it is a highway in the middle of nowhere like literally in the middle of nowhere. And I just, you know, um, before we go to this break, just want to situate myself as a black woman in the middle of nowhere, where really it's a many men, many men, and you don't see very many women it, where we were. So think about that context as well. Um, I was comfortable. I wasn't uncomfortable there, but it was definitely a culture shift to see 
the truckers, to see the people, to see how, even when we stopped for food, how the food was was presented. Um, it was really interesting. It was really interesting. Um, and it made me pause again and reflect about all that we have. And how do I pass on and give more to um, the people who live there and, and learn more about nature conservancy and what's affecting them from where I'm at. So it's time for a break. I'm Dr. Lisa and you're listening to Love and Light. We're talking about environmental justice in the fantastic opportunity I had to go to Alaska with Love is King Project Rome. We'll be right back. to the outdoors I think really took off when I had small children I wanted them to experience fishing I wanted them to experience the outdoors the forest the rainforest I wanted them to experience all of those things and I wanted them to see things that I didn't see when I was younger but I always had a yearning like my soul calling to be out in nature and to experience nature and so that connection for me, I think started at my grandfather's farm, but continued on as I um, got older and sought out places where I could connect with nature. Oregon rivers are important to me. So much has happened in our world. We need more healing, and healing comes from nature. Healing comes from taking care of ourselves and taking care of our souls. And as the water runs in, it heals and it soothes and all that is seems to come together. Water is the necessity of life. It is around us and it is vital to be near it and around it. I am grateful for the River Democracy Act to protect Oregon rivers for my children and the generations to come. Water is a necessity to life and being near it, in it and around it provides comfort and peace. We are back on Love and Light with me, Dr. Lisa. And we're talking about environmental justice and the fantastic opportunity to travel to Alaska with Love is King. And one of the examples of advocacy is the video um, about rivers in Oregon. So we are going to listen to it. And if you are on YouTube, you're going to get an opportunity to actually see it. And um, yeah, check it out. to the outdoors I think really took off when I had small children I wanted them to experience fishing I wanted them to experience the outdoors the forest the rainforest I wanted them to experience all of those things and I wanted them to see things that I didn't see when I was younger but I always had a yearning like my soul calling to be out in nature and to experience nature and so that connection for me, I think started at my grandfather's farm, but continued on as I um, got older and sought out places where I could connect with nature. Oregon rivers are important to me. So much has happened in our world. We need more healing and healing comes from nature. Healing comes from taking care of ourselves and taking care of our souls. And as the water runs in, it heals and it soothes and all that is seems to come together. Water is a necessity of life. 
It is around us and it is vital to be near it and around it. I am grateful for the River Democracy Act to protect Oregon rivers for my children and the generations to come. Water is a necessity to life and being near it, in it, and around it provides comfort and peace. very grateful for that opportunity to be able to participate and advocate and av advocacy for rivers in Oregon. And there are probably the same thing and wherever you are, there's probably river space to av advocate, uh, av excuse me, to advocate for. There are um, green spaces to protect. There are, there are things to do. So wherever you are, um, maybe check some of those things out. One of the things that I'm going to talk about in this next segment is the Alaska Wilderness League. And the Alaska Wilderness League was um, definitely advocating to help protect the, um, the land around this oil drilling. So if you've never heard of the Alaska Wilderness League, it was one of the supporters that supported um, my trip to Alaska with Love is King. And the um, drilling that I'm talking about is called the Willow Project. And what is happening is that um, according, uh, this is from the Alaska Wilderness League advocacy letter, um, at a time when the world is focused on climate solutions and energy cleaning transition, there is so much far reaching oil and gas drilling proposal. And what we're talking about is like three decades of Arctic fossil fuel infrastructure and extraction. And we would plans for up to 250 wells, 37 miles of roads, 389 miles of pipelines, airstrips, and new central processing facility to be built in remote and climate stressed Arctic, the Arctic. And so as Earth Justice and Evergreen Action note in their recent report, no single oil and gas project has more potential to set back climate goals than the Willow Project. The Willow Project is that piece of land that I discussed in the, in the previous segment, that piece of land to drill on the land. And we also spoke to other people who lived on the other side of, um, on the more Western side of the state. And there are indigenous people there tribes who have experienced sickness, cancer, um, lack of clean water. It just seems like a no-brainer to me. It seems like a no-brainer, but there's a lot of money involved. There's a, there's a lot of money involved. And when there's a lot of money involved, are people expendable? I don't think so. I don't think people are expendable. So that's my opinion. And um, I hope that's your opinion too. <laughs> she probably wouldn't be listening to this show. So the Willow Project's climate impact is heightened by its location in the Western Arctic, which is suffering severe stress. As I mentioned, when I was there, it snowed. And it's summer. And in summer, um, it's 24 hour sunlight. And in that 24 hour sunlight, temperatures drop so low that it snowed, that it snowed. So it warms four times, this, uh, this severe stress warms four times faster than the rest of the world. And as one of, like, as Chief Leonard, um, the second Chief Leonard said to me, 
Um, this is, and the other elders said, this is ground zero of climate change. Like they're experiencing it right now in a way that we're not, we're experiencing something, but they're experiencing a, a more severe stress. Because the permafrost is rapidly thawing due to the accelerating impact of climate change, the, the ConocoPhillips has admitted that it has plans to artificially chill the melting tundra to sustain it so that they could drill. That is not good. That is not good. We just need to slow down. And it's not about vilifying anybody in my eyes. It really is about how do we work on our collective well-being. And so if you're interested, please be interested in the Willow Project. Please be interested in taking this piece of land that has not been drilled on. It's actually part of the wildlife refuge. If you look on the map, you'll see the wildlife refuge. And there's a little piece of land up at the top. We can do better. We can. We, we can do better. Not only can we do better, we can do awesome and excellent when we work together. When we work together, we, we can do it. So the Willow Project, the Alaska Wildlife Refuge League, has many, many. There's, I'm looking at the long list of people who support not doing this drilling. And you can sign your name to a petition. You can share this with other people. I think most people do not know about it. And if I wasn't there, honestly, I wouldn't have known about it either. If I didn't see the drilling up close myself, I wouldn't have known about it. If I didn't see the pipeline and touch it, I wouldn't have known about it. It wouldn't have meant the same thing to me that it does today. And that's what the show is all about. How can we, the collective we, wherever you are, how can you deal with and help with this? And it just seems so big sometimes, but together we can do anything. Together we can. So one of the things that I talked about previously is the caribou, the caribou herd. And that herd, that is their ground. And that's their key foraging is in that lake. There's a lake there. And the substance and resource for the community of Arctic Alaska. So when you disturb the herd, you disturb the people who are counting on the herd and you disturb the livelihood of the people. It all makes sense. So please get involved. Please get involved um, with, with helping to pass the word. If you just pass the word to a friend, if you just pass the word that, do you know about this and look up 1002, you would be doing quite a bit. You'd be doing quite a bit for finding out what's going on with people and also listen to the show because I'll have Chief Leonard on. Um, I'm looking at having uh, Elder Sarah James on. I'm looking at having um, Sicknick, who is um, representing um, the another another uh, part of Alaska. Having these people on and hearing their voices. Don't take it take it from me. That was my experience while I was there. I saw that, but also. Let's make space for the voices who are actually living it day to day, who are having that experience day to day. That environmental justice is all of our responsibilities and we can do it. We can do it. So um, I will have on the website, I will have information about um, the Alaska Wildlife Organization who is really, um, helping organize for someone like me to go to see for my, my own eyes. It's hard for me to advocate for something I haven't seen myself, but I have seen it myself. And I am advocating for environmental justice for 10, 1002. 
channel two, please look it up. So we are coming to a break and um, stick with us. I'm going to come back and um, talk some more about environmental justice and the amazing opportunity I had to actually go to Alaska in the back country to see with my own eyes. And um, yeah, we'll be right back. Stick with us. connection to the outdoors I think really took off when I had small children. I wanted them to experience fishing, I wanted them to experience the outdoors, the forest, the rainforest, I wanted them to experience all of those things and I wanted them to see things that I didn't see when I was younger but I always had a yearning, like my soul calling to be out in nature and to experience nature and so that connection for me, I think started at my grandfather's farm, but continued on as I um, got older and sought out places where I could connect with nature. Oregon rivers are important to me. So much has happened in our world. We need more healing, and healing comes from nature. Healing comes from taking care of ourselves and taking care of our souls. And as the water runs in, it heals and it soothes and all that is seems to come together. Water is the necessity of life. It is around us and it is vital to be near it and around it. I am grateful for the River Democracy Act to protect Oregon rivers for my children and the generations to come. Water is a necessity to life and being near it, in it and around it provides comfort and peace. You are listening to Love and Light, Living Every Day in Peace with me, Dr. Lisa. And we're talking about environmental justice and a fantastic opportunity for me to travel to Alaska with Love is King. Luckily for us, we have Chad Brown, who founded Love and King in 2020. Um, and so, Chad, thank you for jumping on to talk to our listeners about this amazing opportunity that I had to go to Alaska. Yeah, thank you for having me uh, be part of this whole, uh, you know, uh, uh, process, this podcast. I really appreciate being here. And that was an awesome, great opportunity to uh, be able to uh, speak into the Love is King, the, the process, the, the environmental justice. Um, yeah, that's right up my alley. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Chad. What I talked about is talked about my experience of um, of going um, I spoke about, um, you know, the, the awarenesses that I had, like, you know, not thinking that I have ever been in the back country before, um, being able to be um, in the Arctic Circle and in the Arctic Village. Um, I talked about the Caribou uh, Tribe. I talked about the Willow Project. And I talked about why it's important for all of us to kind of pick up our head and look around to see how, how other people are experiencing uh, climate change. And I talked about the wildlife um, refuge and the Willow Project again. And, um, and so Chad, tell us, uh, I, you know, I have a right here that you founded Love is King in 2020 in the midst of the George Floyd killing after that. And that it was your response to what we can do. Um, so vital, the work that, um, I have been forever changed being able to be in Alaska and that see for myself. And just what would you say to the listeners or people out there who are wondering like what they could do? Well, um, you know, I, you know, what you talk about folks can do in, in regards to the environmental justice of, of the issues happening up in Alaska. Is that what you're referring yes. to? Yes. Yeah. That's what um, I'm referring to. Sure. Um, 
You know, I, I think the first thing, you know, like it's, it's really, the you know, uh, for folks who have been there, like yourself, myself, and many, um, it, it, it starts off with us actually carrying that baton and raising the awareness of, of, of what's going on, uh, the, everything from the beauty to the environmental issues that are happening up there, because it's so, it's so far fetch, you know, and, 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 and it's out there basically. But the reality is that even though it's out there, that far out there, uh, it, it is affecting us down in the lower 48, uh, uh, whether you don't see it in front of us or it just happens, but it's affecting us a domino effect. Um, you know, the Arctic is definitely a canary in the, in the coal mine. Uh, and, um, you know, but once that awareness is, 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 is raised and that, that awareness is up, what many folks can do when they receive that kind of awareness and understanding um, is is definitely doing, of course, doing more research and reading about what is happening, the current state of of of, uh, of the land, uh, the oil industry, and tying that into the um, into the environmental uh, justice and, and the Gwich'in people, uh, and also the Nupi people as well, you know. But the, just the Native American folks that are up there and how they are being affected by. That and so once when that research evolves, um, you know, there's many opportunities. What many people can do is, you know, connecting with uh, conservation groups like Alaska Awareness League or groups that's just doing the work to help support and 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 get um, get on the ground zero uh, of, of of advocating uh, for the the land, the wildlife, the fresh water, and the indigenous native communities up there. Uh, and a lot of that comes by, you know, bridging that gap with conservation groups to um, to helping basically, you know, from an advocacy standpoint of writing blogs to um, just getting involved or even bridging uh, that uh, opportunity with Native American groups that are doing the work. And that's a little hard to reach to a certain degree, but it's totally possible depending on how far that person or that group is wanting to step in and, and support. Um, but even on the local level, in our senator offices, um, you know, state offices, basically, you know, there's many ways you can be able to step in and help raise your voice and walk in the space and talk about it. A lot of, you know, there's many senators across the United States that are uh, there are affiliated and, and support to protecting the Arctic and, and the people, and they are aware uh, of what's going on. And so it, that could be really interesting of, of local folks walking in and and, uh, and and being able to sit down with the, you know, the senator's office folks and talking about and sharing that experience and sharing the importance of why uh, we need to support and protect um, the Arctic Wildlife Refuge, the Gwich'in people, the, you know, the, 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 the fresh water, the public lands, et cetera, you know, and, and so that there alone, it, it just takes a small effort of maybe 15 to 20 minutes of your time going in and talking about that and, and, and raising awareness. And, and that's really what it takes. And then the more people they can hear, especially on a local level, that just helps create a stronger movement and a stronger push as we are all aware of, the, you know, the, with the Willow Project that's happening, uh, there needs to be more because that's not going to uh, move away so fast, you know, and, and plus the internal of the conservation space and in indigenous communities, um, yes, they're fighting and yes, they are uh, raising the words and yes, they're taking a stand, but it's going to take more of an effort to help challenge that or, or even move that away from where it's going right now. And that effort is going to have to come from the, yeah, it's going to have to come Absolutely. from the Wow. Chad, thank you. We're out of time. Um, that yeah. was, you really did lay it down there. Um, you're listening to Love and Light with me, Dr. Lisa. Um, look on our website for information about Chad Brown and things he has coming up. Um, you know, listen and keep listening because I'm going to keep talking about this particular topic for the next three or four podcasts. So thank you. Remember, treat yourself like your best friend. Thanks for listening to Love and Light with me, Dr. Lisa, Everyday Living in Peace. You spent the last hour engaging in challenging and transformational conversations, all for the purpose of living a peaceful, joy-filled existence. 
Join me next time to continue growing in love and light through healing practices and acts of love. To learn more or work with me, Dr. Lisa, visit educationthroughengagement.com. That's educationthroughengagement.com. Remember, the world changes when we change by coming home to love. Tune in every second and fourth Wednesday at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern, here on TransformationTalkRadio.com.